He used to always say to me, the unexamined life is not worth living. Plato or Socrates who said that? You're just jealous doesn't cut it when attempting to explain why the baby sister estranged herself from her mentor. Their relationship it was very complex, at times very disturbing. But it wasn't because they were competing as fashion models, although certainly being so much older than Susie, it, it had to be difficult watching Susie steal the limelight from Dorian. And it's a pretty safe bet to say that uh, were it not for Dorian, Susie would have never made it as a fashion model let alone as a supermodel. This podcast is part of the Blueberry Network at Blueberry.com. That's Blueberry with no E's dot com. Right on America is brought to you by a generous grant from the Built on Dreams Media Network and from listeners like you. Stand by, please. Going on six. Going on six. This is Adam Skull. Welcome back to Write on America and part two of Bernice de La Salle's beautiful riddle, The Strange Case of Susie Parker. Why did you write this book? I wrote the book because of my fascination with the era of the 50s, but much more importantly, I wrote it because of the relationship that Susie had with her father, George Lofton Parker. It is the subject matter of her life that fascinated my husband the most and me. There are three central characters in the book, three women, all of whom are beautiful riddles. They are Susie, Susie's older sister, Dorian Lee Parker, who was a famous fashion model in her own right during the 40s and the early 50s. Third woman is Sandra Littman Howard, who at the time was the Countess of Suffolk and Berkshire. Beautiful Riddle is an exploration of the father relationship in the lives of these three fascinating women as scrutinized through the eyes of one man, Pitu, who knew them all intimately. For anybody wondering, I lost my father the day before my second birthday when he succumbed suddenly to a heart attack. The importance of the paternal figure in a young girl's upbringing has been a preoccupation of mine all of my life. The father, after all, is the first man in a young girl's existence. And in my case, his absence was keenly felt all of my life. It's no coincidence that as a result of that, I always sought the company of older men. My husband, Pierre, was 27 years older than me. And that's not a coincidence. The importance of the father was absolutely instrumental for Susie and for Dorian and for the Countess of Suffolk and Berkshire. It really determined who they became. Did you not give any second thought to the age difference? No, none whatsoever. I fell instantly for my husband. He was the most charming, the most charismatic, cultivated, witty, funny man, and, and extremely good looking to boot. He had it all for me. He was my best friend. He was my lover. He was everything. And we were together for 40 years, very happy. That's a testament into itself. It most certainly is. What is it that fascinates you about the era of the 50s so much? Well, of course, the glamour of the era has always fascinated me. The fact that I grew up in the 50s, I was a young child in the 50s, the people the preoccupation of the era, fascinated by great conversation, dinner parties and, and luncheons were extremely important, has always fascinated me. And my husband had such fabulous anecdotes about the period. People for decades have been telling me, somebody needs to write a book about this guy. I finally convinced him to give me the story that allowed me to do just that. I'd like to explore that a little bit more. I've always loved to write. I was quite good at it received a number of awards. I didn't pursue it. I ended up becoming a stockbroker uh, for Merle Lynch in their office in Paris in real estate, developing property. Uh, I served on the board of an aerospace equipment company at one point in time. My life gravitated around finance. We moved to Mammoth Lakes. I became interested in the local politics and I started to write for the local newspaper. And that's really where my husband realized that I had a talent and he pushed me. He wanted me to write a book. So I made a deal of sorts with him. And the deal was, well, if you tell me your story with Susie, what happened back then, which he had always been very reticent to do, 
I'll write a book. Would and you so not was, say that this was kind of like making a deal with the devil? For him, it was an incredibly cathartic experience. It came at the end of his life. It was extremely difficult because there were a lot of hurtful things that happened. It was a tragedy of sorts for the both of them. I think that he looked at it almost like a life review. He used to always say to me, the unexamined life is not worth living. You're putting it to him that you would get into writing and follow his lead to pursue it only if he revealed his life to you with Susie Parker. It's a pretty ballsy move of what it took to get to the heart of a story and being a writer by zeroing in on this particular facet. Yes, that's true. And I'll tell you, at the time that he agreed to do this, Vanity Fair had just done an 18-page spread on Susie and her life. <clears throat> he was so disappointed with uh, the article that I think that that propelled him also to tell me the true story and to zero in on the facts of her life that contributed to who she was, who she became. Her story has always been portrayed as a Cinderella story, and this book, it shatters that myth. There's nothing in the book that is done in the spirit of any kind of meanness. It's done in the spirit of understanding what happens to a person when they don't march to the beat of their own drum. I was learning a lot about myself and about the importance of the father, that father relationship in all of these three women, relating it to myself and to my husband also, who had a very difficult relationship with a stepfather who was cruel and very hedonistic, had a very detrimental effect on my husband. It was on the heels of this Vanity Fair article where he walked away saying, that's really not the story. That's not what happened. Which unfortunately happens all too often. Well, you know, I asked the contributing editor who wrote the story why, why she wasn't telling the truth. And she said, point blank, I want to tell the Cinderella story. I want the fairy tale, the myth. Proving and, uh, that they often have their own agenda. She's an excellent writer. It was an interesting piece, but it just, it left a lot to be said. Stories narrated in P2's voice. Why didn't he write the book? That's a good question. The simplest answer is that he felt I could do a better job. He pushed me. He felt that I was quite talented as a writer. It is narrated entirely in his voice so that as you go along, you have the feel at all times that he is telling you a story. He's telling you his story. It's my hope that you will never think that I'm writing the book but that you will walk away with the impression that he did write the book. He spent a full year, every single day, talking to me about these events. Susie's older sister, Dorian Lee, was a famous fashion model of the 40s and 50s. Is this also a story about sibling rivalry? That's another interesting question. And the answer is yes and no. Their relationship was very tight-knit in Susie's youth. Dorian was 15 years older than Susie. Over time, that relationship crumbled quite severely. You're just jealous doesn't cut it when attempting to explain why the baby sister estranged herself from her mentor. Their relationship it was very complex at times very disturbing. But it wasn't because they were competing as fashion models, although certainly being so much older than Susie, it, it had to be difficult watching Susie steal the limelight from Dorian. Dorian was a very complex character uh, who had a brilliant career during the 40s and the early 50s. She was discovered by Diane of Reland. She was the muse of Richard Avedon long before uh, Susie. Avedon had made her famous as Revlon's fire and ice girl. And it's a pretty safe bet to say that uh, were it not for Dorian, Susie would have never made it as a fashion model, let alone as a supermodel. Thank you for joining us for another edition of Right on America. Located on the internet at www.rightonamerica.us. Join us again next time for another edition of Right on America. Once in a lifetime, the theme music for Right on America, courtesy Stephen Paul, used by permission, copyright the Built on Dreams Media Network, all rights reserved.